Welcome to the Duckpin Podcast with your host, Brian Griffiths. And now, here's Brian. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another brand new episode of the Duck Pin Podcast. I am your host, Brian Griffiths. My guest this week is going to be Rob Cornelius, the color commentator at Ohio University, the color commentator of Bobcats Athletics. We're going to talk about broadcasting, college football, and college basketball. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Stick with us on the Duck Pin Podcast. Our guest tonight on the Duck Pin Podcast is somebody who has his hat in many different roles. I actually met him through Republican Party politics, but we're not going to talk about politics necessarily still. tonight. We're going to talk, uh, and still, yeah, uh, and uh, we're actually going to talk about Ohio University athletics and sports broadcasting. Our guest tonight is the color man for Ohio University athletics, Rob Cornelius. Rob, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. I'm frankly not even sure how I got to that job. Maybe that's that's part of the interesting story, but uh, kind of a non-traditional path. For some reason, they let me do sports 50 days a year. Yeah, and I, and that's why I wanted to start with talking about. It. It's like you know, you you know, you you do take an unusual path. This is not you know, unlike a lot of guys who are doing color and D1 sports. Um, yeah, you know, this is not a full time full time gig for you. So, and and on top of that, you're doing two different sports. You're doing you know, college football and you're doing men's basketball. So how the heck did you wind up in the booth doing color? Yeah, I think I faked football better than I faked basketball. But no, it, it's just one of those things, like when I, when I was undergrad at OU back in the 90s, because you and I are roughly roughly the same age, um, I was, you know, what you would expect, the uh, the policy nerd at that point, policy, econ major, honors this, honors that, whatever. But all the friends I kept making in these policy classes and these uh, – you know, classes a little more Socratic format, a little more talky-talky than testy-testy, all of them were journalism school people. And OU journalism school is, is one of the things they're really, really known for. Uh, Matt Lauer's kind of wrecked that, but, you know, we'll get around that. Uh, but you look at that, all these people were just kind of entertaining. And these guys are doing, jerking around. There was, st- was student radio, but it was different at OU in that student radio at OU was not just some little, like, you know, cable carrier signal with guys spinning records, you know, a few hours a day and then jerking around. When you got involved in, in radio there, you were actually broadcast on the, the NPR station. And it's an NPR station at OU that basically dominates southern Ohio, part of West Virginia, Kentucky, almost into, into Pennsylvania, up, up beyond Steubenville. So you're on in like 40 counties on radio and TV. And if you were any good, you start moving up the chain and you're, you're able to read news, report stories, and eventually start doing what students broadcast in, which was like the student like sports talk shows. The students were allowed to do what you would call now the non-revenue sports, Olympic sports, your baseballs, your volleyballs, your wrestling. I really enjoyed doing hockey, which wasn't even a D1 or NCAA sport at, at Ohio, but it was very successful at the club level. Won a couple national titles in the 90s during that time. And I just kept doing this stuff and doing this stuff and hung out in Athens, kind of refused to leave Athens for a little too long. Ended up being the sideline guy for a couple of years on football uh, with Derek Scott, who's now the voice of South Carolina. Uh, he was a Marshall guy, local guy, and just kind of stuck around, did that for several years. And then ended up, um, after our star running back from the late 90s, early 2000s, Chad Brinker, kind of disappeared after one postseason and went back to his, his real day job. I got a call a few weeks for a season. Hey, we need someone to be on the radio. We know you've done it before and you haven't cursed a lot. So congratulations, here you are. And that was about 10 or 12 years ago. So do a lot. they've done a lot of radio on and off the last 20 years. have done some TV, both for OU and then, and then nationally, a lot of what you call these uh, – ESPN three games, ESPN plus games over the years. I worked out west, done, done some for OU, but done some places as ridiculous as New Mexico State and Fresno. So I just kind of got into this. And, you know, on air, stylistically, no, I'm not a player, not at all. Check, check me out. I'm, I'm five nine, five foot nothing, whatever. But it's about communicating. And that's, I think, what I learned a lot to do is to add lib and fill doing local weather and local TV sports. Uh, one of the jobs on the way here. Yeah. And that's, and that's an awesome, awesome background. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who would, uh, you know, who kind of wish they had that opportunity along the way. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, most of the time you get people who are doing one sport. A lot of times, as you point out, former athletes, you know, football guys doing football, basketball guys doing, doing basketball. Now, you mentioned, obviously, you had an extensive background of, of different sports at, at OU. So, you know, how, how does it wind up that you wind up on the big, you know, the big blowtorch, you know, in Ohio for, for a D1 school doing – uh, you know, doing both sports, doing both basketball and uh, and football. 
Well, I mean, obviously it started out with football, but, I, you know, I had always worked around the prior guy, Derek Scott, who kind of came in 97, 98, came up from Marshall and did really good work. And uh, he was just a guy that uh, was, frankly, a, a good friend over the years and trusted me to, to be on the air and, and to get better. You know, starting the sideline, you clearly you, you see what you see. Uh, we had, as I said, some former players, both from OU and from other places, kind of fill the role uh, through the time. But when you get there, you're communicating with, with people. And you got to realize not everyone is going to be as technically savvy and super coach savvy. You're seeing all this technical talk about A gaps and things like that. You're communicating with everybody. So how do you get in and out quickly, say the, same, say the things the play-by-play -play guy isn't saying or help fill him along, and do it on radio. And radio is just so much different from TV. I mean, you, you watch TV football. What happens in TV football? Every play has a replay. Basically, every time you do something, you're going to essentially repeat it and see it again one or two more times. Radio is different. So the way you pilot your way through that's a little different. The pacing's a little different. But, yeah, I mean, I, I last played football in seventh grade. But it's funny to me, you know, people our age, we've now grown up with these fantastic video games. Even back to cartridge systems, even some fat kid on the couch in 1994 could learn entire passing trees, play structures, defense from playing those first few Walsh and Madden games. Those are what the kids have right now. If they want to learn football, they, can, they have it all learned technically before they get to the field if they care enough to do it. The amount of information out there is amazing. So you can get away with not being a player, and frankly, I think it's helpful. I don't think I fall into some bad habits. Too. Sometimes I'm, I'm off on tangents here and there, but our, our broadcast with, with Russ Eisenstein and I, we just try to have a lot of fun. You know, we are trying to be the fans' fan. We're trying to help you enjoy the game more. And sometimes that's stories. Sometimes that's that's what's actually going on the field. But we're your bridge to this team, this game, this university, and this day. Yeah, I think if, if, they, if, if any of those kids are anything like me, they were probably also calling the games in their living room while they were playing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the thing. People have this dream, and it, it's been cool to be able to try broadcasting and enjoy it and keep enjoying it. But frankly – not have everything because it's it's such it's such a hard job to get and it's so thankless on the way up if you truly are starting from from zero out of college you take that first job in hagerstown at the wag you know in my case with wtap in parkersburg they pay you nothing they beat the heck out of you the hours are terrible it's no fun whatsoever guess what there's fewer guys doing weekend sports and small market tv than there are guys in the nfl it's a super super rare hard to get into circle but guess what there's an endless supply of people and that's why you get paid nothing to take that job in Zanesville or Lima or fill in the blank, uh, the Del Marva station out in Salisbury. It's the absolute end of the earth and people will, would pay you to do the job. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating when people think about that, especially as, as stations. Um, and I think this is something people don't think about necessarily is that the way stations have become voice tracked and the stations, the con station consolidation and stuff like that, there are fewer jobs in there, even where when you got started 20 years ago, you know, the, 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 the universe keeps getting, getting smaller. You were at a very unique position um, on March 12th, and that was yeah. a game. The game you you guys, Ohio basketball, was was getting ready to take the court in Cleveland yep. for um, you know for an act tournament game, mm -hmm. and the game never happened uh, thanks yep. to the thanks to the uh, coronavirus and the 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 moving the kind of the quickly moving uh, decision to shut the country down basically. Yeah, it's hard to move and fast that morning was surreal. Yeah, say how surreal was that day? Kind of walk people through kind of what what that day looked like from from your perspective. Well, we, we were set to tip noonish, and as we always are, we're in Cleveland. We stay at the hotel just half a block over, uh, residents in, walk over to the gun or the Quick and Loans Arena, whatever we're supposed to, supposed to call it now. And we get in there, and everybody's uneasy, and it's already beyond friends and family or less crowd. Um, there was maybe going to be 200 people in there that day in the building. Uh, literally friends and family having two or four player comp tickets per person, really no concessions, nothing really going on in the concourse. And the building's empty. And that's the way it been all, you know, earlier in the week they had a women, women's tournament started the day before and they got to that point. Uh, and we get in there and our guys are wondering what's going to happen. We go and interview Jeff Bowles, our head coach, ahead of the game, as we normally do. Players get out there and start the warm-ups about 30, 40 minutes before the game. And they're out there, and they're, and they're walking around, they're shooting. The other team never really comes out. And our guys are kind of wondering what to do. And league media comes to us, hey, the, uh, the commissioners have a press conference at, at noon. That's about 11.45. And uh, word kind of goes out. Our coach is like, well, I don't know if we have to play or not. So our guys, our team, about five till, just starts playing essentially five on five rec ball. They, know, they have a pretty good sense it's over, that we're not going to be done. So we ended up staying on air 10, 15 more minutes, literally, 
calling this open gym game between our, our, our players just shifting in and out, having a good old time, and knowing for some of these guys with seniors, they were probably never going to play again in a meaningful game. It was never, never at that level, never in that building. So Jeff Foles and the guys let them, let them enjoy it as much as we could. And then the inevitable happened about 10 or 15 minutes later. And literally that day, everybody got stopped. There's only one game that rolled through noon. I think it was shut down half. I think St. John's early round of the Big East rolled because we were up at the bar after we got out of our building that had just, just ended um, down the street. And it was just, it was a bizarre, bizarre thing. I mean, I mean you don't want to compare it to 9 11, but just everything shutting down on a day where there should have been 60, 70 basketball games was just, uh, was just mind blowing. And the Mac, for better or for worse, was one of the first to pull, first to pull the plug or be definitive about it. Uh, and that's the thing that happened in football as well this fall. Um, you know, our commissioner, John Steinbrecher, he's made hard decisions. He's a smart guy. I don't fault him. And, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes. We're replacing football this fall or not. Hopefully we get six or eight games in. But that's something that's been, frankly, in question now for weeks as suddenly the Big Ten and others have wanted to spool back up and kind of uh, try this thing. Yeah, how unusual has that been for you? I mean, you've always been doing this for, for a long time. But here we are, you know, early fall. And your Saturdays and, and Tuesdays and whatever other days of the week that, that Matt games wind up on have been, have been free. How unusual is that for you? It's, it, it's crazy, and you don't know what to do. You know, some other sports have pivoted. So, obviously, I'm, I'm, I won't pick up my camera and show you. We have you know, eight TVs in the living room. It's almost a Stewie's, Stewie's sports book kind of situation out here or something. But, no, just watching other things. Um, but you're right. I mean, in terms, in terms of work, it's weird because normally we would have, you know, there's pregame stuff to do, the stuff during the week, if you shoot early TV, you go to some practices. It's not a full-time thing, but there's a lot you would be doing. So we, we, we've missed all that. I've, it's funny, I've got a few high school games that actually, local cable is like, well, hey, you're available. Why don't you come try this? So got to see my high school uh, a couple weekends ago, and uh, I hadn't been to my high school actually to watch a game since Joey Burrow put about 70 points on them. In <laughs> the so, Whatever happened to that guy? I, dude, that's the funniest thing about OU. Um, where we broadcast at OU, they added on to Peden Stadium and built this tower above it, the press box, in the early 90s. And we we're trying to save a little money. So every every game we go there, our office, our pardon me, our studio to broadcast from is the office of the defensive coordinator. And until a year and a half ago, that was Jimmy Burrow, Joey's dad. So we've seen Joey literally grow up in family pictures and kids stopping by the office to like steal a soda or his dad's peanut butter literally for the last decade plus. Great kid, great family. In every respect, he's, as I put it, please date my sister. He is the date my sister guy on, on every roster. He's such a good dude. It's such a good family. And I know it's the Bengals. I love the Bengals. Um, I hope this works. He, you know, I hope he doesn't be a Kelly Smith or John Carter treatment. I hope he has a long, fruitful career most in Cincinnati. Yeah, that, it is a nice story that he did wind up in, in Cincinnati. Obviously, as a Ravens fan. Only well, his, his, his parents, I mean, his dad was, you know, Nebraska-ish. His mom, his mom's still a... a rural county school principal about 20 minutes from Athens. So literally they can be in Cincinnati in two and a half hours and uh, they're going to keep, like, she's going to keep working. She didn't quit. That's you know, awesome. Throws the money, all this stuff. Like, yeah, that's a family. They've been around it. They, you know, dad's been in the CFL. They've got other guys play it in the big eight. I mean, it's, it's a family that gets it. This was not a surprise. And the success is not, they're not going to do anything crazy. That's good. That's good. You talk, you started talking a little bit about the uh, kind of the prep, the work that you do through the week and some of the stuff that you're not doing right now with no games going on. Uh, just go into a little more detail. You know, you mentioned because obviously it's not a full time job for you, but you do are doing you know are doing prep work. What's that? What's a routine week look like for you heading into say a football game? Well, I mean, you know, obviously it, it depends what you're doing because I've done a lot of different roles. You know, I've produced um, TV footballs and versus being on air talent. But you generally go in. You want it's almost like watch the front of that ESPN broadcast. And one of the most popular tyrons or graphics is to build us what's at stake. So you're thinking. What's important here? Is someone going to, you know, make the playoffs, become bowl eligible? Is, you know, is Joey Burrow going to go over 5,000 yards? What are the important things that are going on ahead of time? And then build those storylines. And then also essentially have notes of all the things that are essentially people stories. You know, it's, it's there's a million guys who have 400 receiving yards and 40 catches. Why is this guy interesting? Because remember, your viewer or listener is not always super football nerd. It's alumni, it's some alumni lady, it's my mom. My mom wants to know, you know, did the, did the, did the long snapper, you know, did he get out of Razzi in time to make practice? Like there's a lot of guys who have stories and it, it's, it's a balancing act. You can go get technical football anywhere. That's not what, not what I'm here to do. We're not gonna leave anything on the floor and try and forget about it, but you're trying to serve a lot of masters. So you try to be prepped, know a little bit of something about everyone 
And then in terms of just calling the game, whether play by player or color, I have a pretty good idea on both teams who the eight or 10 guys are that are most likely to touch the ball. I mean, just from the quarterback and build it out, it sounds simple, but if you know those guys, like they're your family members, your cousins, no one's going to get mad when you're a little late and I don't know who number 63 is. You know, it's, obviously no going in who the stars are and you build a big big chart you're going to build a big cardboard you know deal um you can do a dry erase you can do it on a big styrofoam that basically has every position every player starter backup a few notes on each you know what they've done stat wise last five games anything that's important and basically it's, it, to me that's an exercise like you're in you know grade school you know writing down um, vocabulary words and definitions that's how i stick it in my brain and frankly i don't I don't do a lot of that during the week. I do it Friday night, Saturday morning. I don't want to do it right before so I don't forget or so I'm better, better set up with it. But the amount of information is endless. And the other thing we do, I think, in our broadcast is, is creative. You know me. I'm very busy on social media. I literally tweet a lot during the game. Talk to our fans directly when they ask questions. We try to give you everything you can because we're not in that much better spot than the fans are at home. You know, they're seeing – cameras if it's a tv game they can see the same stat panel we get in the stadium is four seconds later but it's on their computer screen or in their phone that's the other thing we talk about this with the pandemic um we're in a situation where a lot of these games are going to be done remotely where people are doing them off monitors they're not on site of the game and as long as there's not that much latency in the internet as long as you can see all the cameras i frankly don't mind doing games off site i would be perfectly happy being stuck in a being buried in a closet uh, with, with my play-by-play my -play broadcaster and just doing games from anywhere from around the country. I like that game of the week format uh, in that you need to, you know, learn something new every time, but be confident doing that. And you're going to see a lot more of that. I think the networks, ESPN and others have figured out, wait, we only need to put like five people on site, everything else we can do remotely. And that's going to change the way they budget these things a lot. You don't need a giant TV truck unless it's Monday night football. You know, I, these high school games that, that I've been doing, but I mean, just generally speaking, you can switch a five camera broadcast on an iPad right now. This is different. Things are so much, everyone has production capability that you didn't have five or 10 years ago everywhere. So it's going to change the way we do all these things. Yeah. I'm, I'm been assuming that too, just seeing what some of the other, not just sports, but you know, award shows and even the political conventions, just seeing kind of some of their setups, you know, and, and doing it from people, you know, people just having big setups in their house and you don't have to, have to yeah, I have, I have a green screen in one of my spare bedrooms. Why do you think that was funny to do? Um, you know, now you're getting like part of my bookshelf. And I think you can see my uh, red, red, the red roof and bobblehead guy back there, you know, and stuff like oh, that. That's what's behind me right now is my green screen. So that's my new toy. Right, right. That's your new toy. Yeah, no, I went through that phase a while ago. We'll bring it back if we get to. <laughs> um, so when you go to the when you go to the stadium, what does like your game day routine look like? You know, every every player, everybody who's involved with performance, you know, getting you know performing, which which is what that is. You know, being color obviously is performing. What's your kind of routine to kind of get yourself ready? You mentioned that you do some of your work morning of, in order to you know do your prep work. But what's like your what's like your game day routine like to get it get ready for the game? Well, I mean, get there. Uh, it's it's funny for the home games. It's 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 great. My my wife and all our all our college friends while they're out there tailgating, I just have to duck out of that a little earlier and uh, not have any beverages. But uh, I go, go nice and early. We we start cooking. Uh, put up you know what I would call a uh, low low major parking lot setup. You know, with multiple TVs, but not like a full RV and generator and all that nonsense. Uh, you know, walk over, walk in, take my mom lunch because she always parks right next to Frank Solich. He loves that, I think. Um, Go upstairs and look. This talk to folks who've seen more of the team than I have during the week. Um, you know, talk to. Uh, there's a couple. Um, I said, let's say boosters. There's a couple old guys who are at every practice, and they've been there for 40 years. Seem like I know everything. Uh, a couple of our, you know, our new. We have one newspaper reporter who actually has been. Uh, he's been furloughed, so I'm not sure what he's going to be doing this season when we actually start playing. But you know, talk talk to the guys who've seen this stuff. Walk around the field. Talk to the uh, head trainer. Usually, you know, even with Pippa, he can give you an idea who's hot and who's cold, um, pull the dress list, uh, talk to our PA guy uh, who always likes to make jokes about our arch rival Miami and uh, how he opted to go to Nam rather than Miami. He's always good for a laugh. Um, but no, it, it just, you know, it varies. Like some places, you know, there's a big food spread set up. It's, it's a very big deal. And in the Mac, a lot of times it's not. You know, you go, you go to Kansas and uh, um, they've got, you know, the basketball coach is like prepare a giant meal for everybody versus, you know, you might just get popcorn at Kent State. These things vary. Um, but it just, it's, every place is different. Um, my favorite, so I think was Tennessee. Um, 
big like Dairy Queen cooler, and they left it unlocked all week. So we get down there early in the week, and they're just yeah, always, always sweet. SEC feeds you. Some of the places uh, SEC you will still have uh, occasionally a, a beer in the press box during or post game. Louisville still bid on that too. Well, they oh. are. They've had some problems. <laughs> um, that's actually that is actually surprising that they have some yeah, and, and the right south the is box. still they're still a little, still pretty cool on some of those things <laughs> further south you go you'll be surprised uh <laughs> well you know you, you you hear the story so maybe i shouldn't be surprised um let's talk about that travel you know you talked about you know you guys travel various you know out of athens to various different <laughs> places sometimes in you know in the mac and, and sometimes you know doing some of those games you know those um you know, those guarantee games, as they like to call them, you and know, we, on the road. We do that. That's September, the September for us. Had our September been normal this year, would have been uh, – last year involved Pitt. That was our, our big out-of-conference. This year it would have been uh, Boston College, Marshall, Texas State, and some FCS team, I forget, but you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, Ohio is scheduled differently. We very rarely take in the big SEC, here's a million dollars, we're going to beat the tar out of you. We generally tried to schedule winnable wars – um, you know, we've done Ohio State like three times in my time, but the reality is we generally are aiming at Illinois, Purdue, somebody where we might steal one or have a shot. So well, we're not going to get the huge payoff, but occasionally we're going to grab one. And a lot of the Michigan schools in Northern Illinois have done a great job going in and stealing Indiana, Purdue, Min- we got Minnesota once. That's the kind of thing. It's been manageable. We've never like basically told our kids, you know, you're, you're going to get the snot beat out of you. Yeah, and that's yeah. been one good thing. Regardless of the AD, Frank Solich has generally managed that. We haven't done Florida in nearly 20 years. Um, so that's kind of been, been where we are. Travel-wise, the Mac's ideal because it's small. It's mostly, it's mostly a bus league. Um, there's about three places football would charter and fly. But in all this time where we're talking about travel expense, Title IX, all, things are changing right now. People are using the pandemic's excuse to cancel Olympic sports. Uh, cut budgets here. I think you're going to see a situation where football and basketball are on one level and the leagues continue. I think everyone else is going to go to an Olympic sports, what I call super regional or D3 scheduling. You're going to be in a 400 mile van tether. And I think that's what's going to happen um, because you've just seen some of those leagues, it's just too much. Um, it, you know, West Virginia plays in the, what's now the big 12, their nearest opponent's 800 miles. Yeah. And that's fine for football. You do it once a year. It's terrible for softball. It, it, it's inexcusable for the sports that don't generate any revenue at all. Yeah, I, I thought about that, you know, because as the super conferences continue to grow, I mean, even even from our perspective here in Maryland, you know, having our closest rival in the Big Ten be Rutgers and then Penn State and then mm, you know, volleyball, the volleyball team having to go to Lincoln, Nebraska for, you know, I mean, which is just just illogical. What's kind of the travel setup for you guys? Like when you guys go on the road, um, whether it's a mat game and you guys are sure. busting it or you're chartering it to, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing Buffalo, you might fly to yeah, bu- Buffalo. You fly Northern Illinois. You would fly to Rockford international. Uh, that's, that's closer. And it's international central Michigan, but the rest, the rest are, are buses. And I mean, you know, Athens to Bowling Green's 181 miles, Athens to Toledo is 201. You get the idea. Athens to Akron and Kent 160. Yeah. Those are all really, really manageable and really, really expensive. But you're going to go the night before. You're going to stay at uh, a Priceline three-and-a-half-star hotel that has to have in-house food service. In other words, you have to have banquets and meeting rooms to fit 125 people because you're going to travel, this whole team, crew, coaches, all that staff. Um, so that's one thing. That's why you can't just stay at uh, you know, some of these small towns. Some of these Mac towns don't have a hotel that fits that. You go to Ball State, we stay in the outskirts of Indy because Muncie doesn't have a full-service you know, holiday in from the 70s that fits that need. Um, that kind of thing. Other places obviously do. Uh, if you come to Athens, you generally stay in Columbus because there's really not a hotel of enough size. There's one, but it's it's marginal. Most teams don't don't use it. But the Mac is kind of is kind of weird that way. But you get the full thing. I mean, it's not like you know these teams are going and traveling day of like the high school thing. I mean, at the at the D1 level, even even down to Sun Belt, Mac, and whatnot, you expect to be on the road, treated well, travel well, and, and we generally do. Let's talk about uh, postseason play, particularly uh, let's start with the NCAA tournament and, and um, you know, Ohio having most recently gone there in 2012. What's that experience like? I mean, obviously, you know, you're an alum, so your team is going to the NCAA tournament, you know, so you've kind of got, I'm excited as a fan, but I'm also excited because I'm the broadcaster and I get to go. Um, so what's kind of, the, what was that experience like? What's, what are some of the things you know, that an average fan on the outside is not thinking about when, when it comes to 
you know, a team, team staff going to, to an NCAA tournament appearance. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's mind blowing. You're basically Cinderella for, you know, the week or at least however long you last, you know, in 2012, it lasted two weeks. You know, we were, we went deep into that tournament, went all the way to St. Louis, lost to North Carolina, had a shot to tie and win that one at the end. The 2010 one uh, was in Providence uh, and we beat Georgetown and it was a blowout and it was a blowout the whole way. And that was before they had, all four games at the same time running a national team. It was so bad they dumped out. Uh, our fans nationwide were a little annoyed because we were beating Georgetown by too much. Um, so that was cool. That was unexpected. That was an Ohio team that was the uh, what eight or nine seed in the league tournament. They were not expected to do anything. But had two of the best freshmen in Ohio history. Uh, DJ Cooper, point guard, essentially set and broke all the little guy records in Ohio. And uh, a guy from Indiana who transferred in who uh, ended up not being the greatest person but for one week, he was the best guard in, in this part of the country and got us where we needed to get. Um, that team then lost to Tennessee in the second game in Providence. Providence is a good town, by the way. Uh, it was a fabulous, fabulous day, well-treated and all of that. And, um, you know, the fans just loved it because they, they had never – hadn't been in 15 years. The last time that Ohio had been, uh, you know, that distance had been with the Gary Trent teams in 93-94, that area. Um, you know, when the Mac had Gary and Bonzi and then Wally Zerbiak and Devin Davis and, and was really, really good and was putting multiple teams in the tournament. That's what the Mac really hasn't done of late. That's basketball's kind of sunk. 12 was crazy because Ohio was pretty much favored to win the league and was really, really good and then got in that tournament and won and just kept winning. Uh, and it, it really wasn't expected. We, you know, it, it started out in Nashville, two wins down there. Uh, beat Michigan, beat South Florida, um, you know, brand name teams, but teams that played obtuse styles that favor the little guy beating you. South Florida, super slow down. Michigan, a team from a big conference, but not one that relied on big pro players. They didn't beat on you. You know, the, the worst matchup for Ohio was a team like Tennessee. A, it's a big SEC team, physical, um, not doing anything artsy, just pounding you. But when Ohio played teams that are running boutique styles, it worked. And we were very high variance. When we lost games in, in those years, we lost them badly. When we won, John Gross is our coach at that point. He went to Illinois. Now he's back at Akron trying to get the heck out of there because they're out of money. Um, he's a great coach. He's going to be someplace else soon. But he ran a lot of speed up, um, a lot of defense that forced a lot of turnovers, took a lot of risks, and a lot of pace. It wasn't Royal Marymount, you know, it wasn't that. It wasn't the Westfall thing, but it was fast enough. And we had just enough guys to get it done. Um, and, and I think we'll, I think we'll get there again. You know, we're on, on Lum's coach, Jeff Bowles, who is basically Gary Trent's wingman. He's a his screen setter from the early 90s teams. Guy who's had experience, recruited the heck out of the ball at uh, Ohio State with Mata, and we're going to be good again soon. Good to hear, good to hear. Because I remember, you know, that was some great basketball back during those days, too. Those were the years, you know, I, you could always count on the Mac to get two, three bids to the tournament and always to make noise in the tournament, um, yeah. you know, which was, always, which was always fun to see. You know, I, I miss – the one thing I think that's been lost with all of this conference reshuffling that's been benefiting football is that you lose those Wichita State stories and, you know, those Miami teams and Ohio teams, um, you know, being able to, to like, get those games to prepare for the NCAA tournament and, and to have a lot of those smaller conference guys advance. And I think that sucks for the tournament, honestly. And that's what I worry about this year because they've already said basketball is going to start later than expected. I think Thanksgiving week instead of early November. They're going to cut five or six games essentially off the limit of what you can play for the season. And a lot of these tournaments where you go someplace exotic are either not going to exist or they're going to be played in bubbles or they're going to be played in Sioux Falls. And I read the other day that the Atlantis tournament, which is beautiful. You love the beach. Lost my wedding ring on that one on a water slide. Um, but, yeah, like that's going to be in Sioux Falls. So you're going to lose six games. You're going to lose a lot of those guarantee games as well. So the chances for Wichita or an Ohio or someone to go steal a game they're not expecting in November, December, it's not going to be there. Yeah, I mean, I having you know, I've been to the, to Nassau, I've been to Sioux Falls, and I could not think of two places much different than those two locations um, for having a tournament. Um, Coach Shashevsky, Mike Shashevsky, down at Duke, actually had proposed letting everybody into the tournament this year. I'm not necessarily on board with that, but what's your thoughts about that? I don't hate it, and I always kind of dreamed about this because I don't know what the official count is this year for teams like 356, something like that. Yeah. 320 is a nice round number because what you could do, you could essentially have the top 64 wait for 
320 minus 64 the other. Essentially have those teams all play it down to 64 versus 64. 320 is a perfect multiple of 64 for you math nerds. Let everybody in, but hold the top 64 seeds and wait for everyone to shuffle out of that nonsense. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. Sit, it, sit it, 30, it, play 270 or whatever against each other, and then hold the top 64 to play what comes out of that mess. Yeah, and then say it once in the tournament. We all get a shirt. I, I can't <laughs> I can't imagine having to try to predict the perfect bracket for that tournament, though. No, that'd be, um, yeah, I've been on a plane trying to do a CBI bracket uh, while doing well, broadcasting Ohio basketball. <laughs> no, no money was bet, so I think it was cool. But, okay. yeah. Doing a CBI basket, doing a CBI bracket on the plane to the inside boy tournament in 2012. That's me. That's this awesome. Guy. Yeah. We had mentioned NASA, and that kind of brings up the, the topic of heading back to football for a little bit, talking about bowl games. And, and Bahamas Bowl was the greatest experience in history. I want to hear more about that in a amazing. second. Uh, but, you know, well, let's talk about some of those far-flung locations that, that, that you guys have done bowl games in. Boise, Shreveport, Montgomery, Alabama, NASA. You know, talk about talk about some of these experiences. Because you know, everybody everybody sees what's on TV, which is usually a game kicking off at a weird time on a Tuesday with nobody there. So talk about everything that goes on beyond that. Well, again, again, there, yeah, those are those are conference games in October, and November. These bowl games, it, it, it's really funny because some of them are great. Some of them, like the it's it's like the town still thinks it's 1998, and they take the bowl seriously, and there's parades, there's entertainment, and they actually you know, take care of the kids and there's fun things to do. And some of these bowls are played on the moon and you just stay in the Hilton all week. And then you walk out after four days, you go play a football game. Um, you know, I good example that was probably St. Petersburg. We played the uh, Devil Rays Dome Bowl. It was actually, I think it was, a, was it the Bitcoin Bowl that year? It was moronic. It was like, the, it, it was like there was the Bitcoin yeah. Bowl. There was the Beef was, or Brady's they Bowl. Didn't have a, it was, it was, it was Beef or Brady's that year. We'd been Bitcoin one year, year before that ever made a logo with. And this it was the Magic bowl. Jack Bowl at one point. That that bowl right. had a lot of weird names. We did that with the East Carolina, but that was a literally, and you know, St. Petersburg's basically a movie set. No one actually lives there or anything yeah. happens. So, like, our kids are downtown there. It's like a Publix, a Hilton, and nothing else. Um, that's not a good bowl experience. Good bowl experience has been Boise. Uh, the town loves it up, picks care of you. We got out there and won twice. Love the place. Now they're sick of the Californians moving in, but that's for another show. Uh, but no, we, we did that again this year. Love Boise. Um, the Alabama destinations, Mobile still takes it seriously. Mobile still has, they do a Mardi Gras that's timed around the end of the year there. And like, you know, they, they claim to be ahead of New Orleans. They did it first or something. So you get a legit parade. You get bags of rice thrown at you. You get actually a really good time. Like they, it's, it's the south of the south. They muck. They still love that bowl. Uh, Montgomery, that's a movie set. That's like downtown Little Rock. It's not amazing. Um, done that one. Uh, where else have we been? Obviously Detroit. That's that's the absolute that's that's the biggie because you play the Mac title game in Detroit, and if you're lucky or depending on your point of view, unlucky, you get to go back and do it again. Haven't done that again in a while, but uh, that's that's generally in in the hopper. But uh, the Bahamas Bowl was number one uh, because literally you're in a foreign country. There were no rules. Our opponent was UAB, who had like had football canceled two years before and come came back. So they were just excited to be there. And that's always an important thing. Get a team that's like brand new to this or excited to be there that just jerks around all week in Atlantis and we beat the tar out of them, which was good. Uh, made for good TV, but it's like the whole thing was jury rigged together. The scoreboard was clearly being run like out of your iPad. It was like, you know, look the fonts just like hand built like multiple, you know, screens up there, things that weren't even the game. Like someone may have been playing a video game up there. Um, and you have to also find, I'll send you the link, but there's a fabulous story. Uh, it might've been Deadspin of basically someone went down there and did a catalog or like a, a triptych uh, of their of their trip. Um, there was like bow and arrow shooting on, on, on the concourse. You could do that. People were just carrying in beer right and left. Uh, our, like our, our punters family carrying cases of beer in the locker room, not realizing it was the locker room. Um, trophy almost got left at the airport. I have this picture of it just like sitting like 300 feet away from everybody because almost left it. I mean, the, the whole thing was just ludicrous. The whole thing, I mean, it wasn't unsafe, but you're just like, I can't believe this. You know, after all, all the security theater we kind of go through here in America, it was clearly just whatever, bring whatever, you're whoever. And uh, we had to broadcast what I think was the prime minister or the president's box, which was basically like your college apartment, um, a dilapidated fake leather couch and a plumbing toilet didn't really work so they were flowing and yeah it was just it was, the whole experience was, was ludicrous but it was fun everybody had a great time and we would happily do that again i don't know why a more important bowl is not played in the bahamas 
Interesting. I wonder if it's because of facilities, honestly. Um, it's a soccer stadium, and it is on the surface of the sun, the, day, the time of day they play it, more or less. So it's not great on that. But again, if it's some random Wednesday in late December, uh, watch it and realize it is, it is a blast. I cannot recommend that more highly. Yeah, and Nassau is a cool town. Anybody who hasn't been to Nassau, I highly recommend getting there. Of all the, the, the sports, all the games, all the events that you've covered, um, what's the biggest moment you've covered? It sounds like the Bahamas Bowl was your favorite, or at least one of your favorites, but what is the biggest, like most important moment that you've, you've been able to cover? Um, it, it's funny. It's one that only, I mean, it, it only will matter to Ohio fans. And it, it's, you would normally expect me to say that 2010 or 2012 basketball tournaments but it's a game. It was the first year I was doing this, this stuff. It was 1998-99 um, basketball season. And I was along as essentially color, but essentially just basically the guy who does the pre and the post for the, for the basketball broadcast, all of our play-by-play guy. And early season, we're, we're headed to play Syracuse in the November. And it's a Syracuse team that had like eight guys that played in the NBA. Um, Bland, Shumpert, you, you name it. Every guy you can remember from 96 to 98 was on that team. Blackwell, Aton Thomas, all these guys have made all this money. Ohio the year before in basketball was terrible. We were in the post-Gary Trent era, and our head coach, the uh, late Larry Hunter, he had made a decision the year before. He was like, we're going we're gonna to take, take a beating. I've got gaps in this roster. I'm going to recruit some guys. I recruited a couple high D1 transfers, a guy named Sean Stoner from Ohio State, guy named Ladrell Whitehead, who played at Wyoming. Um, prior year, we're 5-21. We're on our way to Syracuse. We started our season basically later than, later than anybody in the country. We had played two games up to that point. One against a D3 team in Ohio named Wilmington, whose coach was a former Larry Hunter GA. Burn the tape, not broadcast. Uh, we played Bowling Green, Dan Dockich. Uh, league rules, it was not televised. League rules, no tape chair out of the league in the preseason. Burn the tape. We go to Syracuse, they have no tape on us, no expectations of any kind whatsoever. We go in there at the Carrier Dome, the Carrier Classic, Friday night, and like we did the Georgetown in 2010, led wire to wire, absolutely kick their ass up and down with guys they had never seen before. Um, and it was an amazing thing to watch Jim, Jim Beheim lose his mind. Um, sitting right next to me uh, was Donovan McNabb doing student radio for Syracuse. Because everyone at Syracuse has student radio. Everybody, like six student radio stations. But anyway, to me, that was like the just absolute punch out of nowhere. The best, that, that was the Pearl Harbor of Ohio basketball history. One of the damnedest things I've ever seen. That team was the most talented team in the MAC this year. That year, didn't win the league. Um, at the end of the year, I, I have some t shirts. I can send you one of uh, the MAC champions t shirts where we lost three games at the end of the season to not win the MAC and not make the tournament but I have the 97 Mac title shirt and I wear it occasionally to Bobcat events. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Have you ever thought about, you know, you talked about how, you know, you, you've done some like games for like ESPN three and stuff like that. Have you ever thought about doing it at a higher level? Uh, I, I guess with potentially with, as you've talked about, talked about, you know, the, the fact that maybe the, 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 the paradigm is going to shift for this as far as yep. how networks do this. Would you do it at a higher level or do you just want to? I, I mean, I, 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 I would love to. I think everyone would love to. Um, but it's one of those things, there's an endless supply of people and my niche, I'd, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at this, but the niche is, as you said, it is, and this is the stereotype in broadcasting. So many of the play by plays are guys from the East coast who went to Syracuse. That's seemingly 65% of people in the industry. That's probably high, but that's literally like the stereotype is shorter dude from New Jersey who went to Syracuse. And that's a lot of the game. Um, and then the color side is, is usually a former player. Um, you know, I, I like to think uh, I'm somewhere in that Dennis Miller, you know, I, I'm going to do, a, I know the game well enough, but I'm not sure I'm your flavor. You know, if, if you want, you know, do, I mean, I'm not going to give you a purely like, uh, you know, super nerded up Keith Law broadcast or something either, but I don't know. Uh, if someone hears it and likes it, fine. It's not like I, I go and overly try and, and sell myself, but yeah, and I think the opportunities for me, if I got back in a more, more full-time way, frankly, producing TV. And that's being the guy in the truck, like, you know, essentially setting up the show. Um, I'm really good at that. I uh, haven't done it about a decade, but that's, that's kind of, I think there's going to be space. There's always room for talent. There's always room for people who can produce and direct. Everything else, sadly, is fungible. You know, camera people, technical people, audio people. 
talent and producers are always going to be there and be in demand. If you're really, really good, um, they'll find you. Just like I say, you know, people don't get forgotten and get, you know, end up at D3 that are pro players. It's one of those things. They'll find you. You can, you can, you get found if you're really, really good. One last question before we get you out of here. If P, if, if you know any, if people there, there, I'm sure there are lots of people, you know, who want to do color, want to do play by play. And that's, you know, whether that's, they want to go all the way to do the Super Bowl or they want to, you know, color, you know, cover JV football down the street. If people want to get involved with doing it, uh, what's your best piece of advice to them? The best thing is to do it. The best thing is always reps. And at this point now, you literally have enough equipment in your hand to, to sit at a game and, and, and record a game um, anytime you want, be it, be it radio, be it uh, essentially dummied up TV. You can put together a tape pretty quickly. You don't have to actually be on air to do it. And you can produce all the things people want. When they hire you for radio or TV as talent, can you do live? Can you communicate? Period. That's all it is. But your, your tape is, is nothing but, but stand-ups and live work, stand-ups and policies. And by that, I mean communicating with other people on the desk or on your broadcast. It may be just a happy talk. Again, like in local TV, it's you and the weatherman. Can you ad-lib at all? Or, or are you just wooden? Or are you a person? And being a person is about 90% of it. Stop rehearsing. Stop, stop worrying about things. People just aren't comfortable enough with themselves. Just be confident that what you're doing is, is good. Rob Cornelius, always good to talk to you, man. He's the color commentator for Ohio University. You can find him on Twitter at Rob C W V. Always good to talk to you, man. Thanks, brother. Best you and your family. All right. Thanks a lot. You too, man. Many thanks to Rob Cornelius for joining me in this week's episode of the Duck Pin Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you subscribe. Uh, here at on YouTube, you can subscribe. Just go to anchor.fm slash the duck pin or search the duck pin uh, and, and subscribe to the duck pin podcast and have it delivered automatically to the device of your choice. You don't want to miss an episode of the duck pin podcast. Be sure to check us out at the duck pin.com for all things duck pin that we are doing over there and, and all the great work that our writers are doing. Please follow us on social media. We're at Facebook, facebook.com slash the duck pin. We are on Instagram at the duck pin and we are on Twitter at the duck pin. And please share us with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, coworkers, co religionists in-laws and outlaws. There are many folks still who may not be familiar with the duck pin or the duck pin podcast. So please make sure to share us with your social networks and spread the good word about everything that we are doing here over at the duck pin. If you want a shirt, we have a shirt. You can, you can click on the link here at the Teespring store uh, that you see at the bottom of the screen here, and you can go ahead and buy a duck pin logo shirt mask and a couple of other stuff too, and that really helps spread the word about the duck pin as well. And if you have any questions, you can always contact us, the duck pin at gmail.com. If you have any guest suggestions, if you have any comments or feedback, we would love to have you email us there. And please, when you are subscribing to us on podcast, if you are, um, if you are, if are watching us on YouTube, leave a five-star review, hit like, you know, you know, let us know you're watching in the comment section. And we appreciate all the feedback that we get there too. For everybody here at the Duck Pen, thank you very much for listening and watching this week's episode of the Duck Pen Podcast. I am Brian Griffiths. Good night and God bless. This has been the Duck Pin Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and download.